Hey friends, this is Jessica from Three Rivers Homestead and in today's video I'd like to show you some of my favorite ways to use up your excess eggs because if you're like me here in Northwest Ohio, this is our season of an abundance of eggs through the spring and the summer. Just like with anything else in nature, eggs are a seasonal food. God created everything in nature to have seasons of productivity and seasons of rest. And when it comes to poultry and egg laying creatures like chickens and geese and turkeys and um, ducks, their season of productivity is the spring and summer months. The amount of eggs those creatures lay is dependent on several factors. The first is sunlight. So the more hours of sunlight in the day, typically the more they will lay. In the winter when the daylight decreases, a lot of birds will stop laying altogether or um, significantly decrease the amount of eggs that they lay, unless you are supplementing those birds with some light in their coop. And here on our homestead, we choose not to do that. We give the birds a break, and so we often go without um, eggs for a small portion of the time throughout the winter, and then we have to preserve eggs to get through that uh, portion of the year. So sunlight affects egg production. Temperature can affect egg production if it gets too cold or too hot. That can stress the bird, and stress obviously will affect fertility and health and egg output. Also, as I mentioned, the health of the bird overall, if they are unhealthy, they're going to stop laying eggs, and then the type of food that you give them. So if they aren't getting an adequate diet, they may stop laying eggs because nutritionally they can't, um, they need everything they're getting just for basic function, and then they will cease laying eggs until they get adequate nutrition. So all of those things can cause a drop in egg production and winter is just a prime time for that because they're nutritional. Um, what they're getting nutritionally is different when they're not out foraging for bugs and getting fresh greens as much and they're stressed from the weather and they're not getting the sunlight. So anyways, now is spring. They're picking back up and laying and we have so many eggs coming in that I have to come up with ways to use them. And so we eat very seasonally here. During the winters, if you noticed in my pantry challenge meals, breakfasts have a lot more breakfast meat and then maybe baked goods. But as spring comes around and we're getting a lot of eggs, we will eat eggs in some way, shape, or form for most of our breakfasts. And then we're also trying to find creative ways to use those eggs in our dinners and lunches. And then the desserts we cook also change. Throughout the winter, we find desserts that use less eggs. And then in the summer, we're cooking things like, or baking things like angel food cake or pound cake, um, things that require a lot of eggs. And so hopefully these recipes in this video will help inspire you to find some ways to use up your excess legs. Legs, your excess eggs. Let's go ahead and get started. Here are some of my recipes. First, we need to get our eggs clean. And during the spring when it's pretty rainy out, sometimes our egg baskets can look like this despite having a neat and tidy coop. Ducks are notorious for finding the muddiest spot in the run <laughs> to lay their eggs and they will come in filthy. And then the rest of the birds, if they're walking around in the mud outside and they go into the nesting box to lay their eggs with muddy feet, Sometimes that can get a little mess on the chicken eggs even. So I have to take time several times a week to wash up any of the dirty eggs. If they're clean eggs, they sit out on the counter. Um, no need for refrigeration so long as you keep the bloom intact and don't wash that off. But when they're muddy, we do want to clean those off before we use them so we don't get any filth into whatever dish that we're eating. So I just give them a gentle scrub under some water. I have a dedicated scrub brush. We get all the eggs nice and clean, and then we can store them away to use in our recipes for this week. So let's go ahead and start with our first one. This is one of my favorite breakfasts to make, and on this particular day, I'm experimenting with making it using some of our sprouted whole grain um, wheat berries. So we are going to go ahead and grind them fresh, these were soaked and sprouted and then dehydrated wheat berries. I run them through my grain mill and then we're going to make a whole grain sprouted flour out of it. Now to use this recipe, you don't have to go to all of that trouble. You can use store-bought pre-ground flour and it will work just fine. So there is no need to, um, you know, you don't really need to adjust this recipe. So all we're going to use is eggs 
and flour and some type of milk. So we started for every six eggs we put in our blender, we are gonna add three fourths a cup of flour. And we're also going to add three fourths a cup of milk. Since we're using a denser whole grain flour, I am gonna go ahead and add just a teaspoon of baking powder to my mixture. I usually leave that out if I'm using a, a white flour or something that's a little lighter and fluffier. Adding just a little bit of vanilla to that milk mixture. And we're gonna go ahead and get all of this in the blender, blend it all up, and then pour it into our greased pan. You can see that my littlest guy there, he's upset, he wanted to do the pouring, poor thing. Um, but we're just getting this poured in. I ended up tripling the recipe, so this was a great way to use up 18 eggs for one breakfast, which is pretty typical for my children and my family. And this is what the denser version of it looked like. If you use a fluffier flour, it's going to rise a little bit on the edges like a Dutch baby or a German pancake. We're going to cover it with some type of syrup. For us this day, we're going to use some home canned peach syrup that was preserved last year. And sometimes we use maple syrup, other types of fruit syrup. You can make a honey syrup. You could put jelly on top, um, something like Nutella or a hazelnut spread. Anything kind of sweet to add to the top. Since there's no sugar in the mixture that we baked, this is how you're going to add your sweetness to this breakfast. My little ones also like to pour a little bit of powdered sugar on the top, and I have no problem allowing them to indulge in that. They think it's really fun to shake the little <laughs> powdered sugar um, shaker. But you, So you can add anything. You could put some chocolate chips on top, add some fresh fruit. This is pretty versatile, but it's just a really easy way to use up a bunch of eggs. It makes kind of like a cake-like texture. It is eggy and denser than a cake, but um, it tastes amazing. And my kids always request this. And through the egg laying season, we typically have this breakfast at least once a week. Now, many of you know that I can't eat wheat. And so I thought I would show you an alternative, a grain-free option. This is something that we made this week that um, is more GAPS friendly, or I guess paleo friendly, if you need a breakfast idea to use up eggs that um, does not use grains. So we are gonna make a zucchini and carrot bread. And I have some freeze-dried shredded carrot. I also have some freeze-dried shredded zucchini here. And the night before I wanna make this, I just add a little water to these jars and put them in the fridge and they will fully rehydrate overnight and be ready to use the next day. So it doesn't matter if you added too much water, you can simply drain the excess out before you're gonna add this to your baking mixture here in the morning. So let me go ahead and show you, this is what we're gonna make. This is Gap Zucchini Bread. I originally got this recipe from the Gap's book 10 years ago, and we kind of adapt it to make it suit our needs. As I mentioned, instead of fresh zucchini, we're gonna do half carrot and half uh, zucchini. I also adapted this recipe by using half coconut flour and half almond flour, and I am actually doubling the recipe. So I put all my dry, dry ingredients in, and then I added some of our homegrown raw honey. That is the sweetener that we're using for this. I drained off that carrot and added it. Next, I drained off the zucchini. And then we're gonna add eggs. And so since we're doubling it, this was a good way to get rid of six duck eggs and get them in the mixture. We added two bananas. And then we're gonna to have to mix this all together, mash those bananas into the mixture. As you could see from the recipe card, this also called for baking soda. It has cinnamon, nutmeg. It's just a delicious treat that despite not having any grain in it, it does end up tasting like a bread once it's all done. So we're gonna get that thoroughly mixed together. I'm gonna to grease a pie dish I also decided to add some chocolate chips. You can add uh, cocoa powder or something if you would like to, but I thought chocolate chips would be nice. So I greased that pie dish. We're gonna pour the batter in, and then we're gonna bake this on 350 degrees until it is done. 
With this, we're gonna use up more eggs. I have some leftover mashed potatoes, approximately three cups in the bottom of a bowl. And I added six eggs to that, just a little bit of almond milk. And we're gonna mix this all together with some salt and pepper. And we are gonna turn this into, I guess, waffles. A lot of people make potato pancakes. We're gonna do the same process, but we're gonna use our waffle maker to cook this up. And between the zucchini bread and this, we were able to use up a dozen eggs on this breakfast. So that is wonderful. Here's what we're serving this with. You can see our little potato waffles there. We have some coconut yogurt and some homemade white chocolate and cranberry granola. I sliced up some grapefruit for the kids. And then here is that Gaps Friendly uh, uh, zucchini bread. So it looks delicious. It smells amazing. The taste is very fluffy. It's not at all dense like you would expect a grain-free bread to be. Just a wonderful little treat if you can't, um, if you need something gluten-free or grain-free for a breakfast. There's what the inside looks like. And the kids were very happy with this meal. For my little ones who can't eat a grapefruit easily, we just typically juice that up and just put it in a cup. And that is how they enjoy their grapefruit. I do make uh, coconut yogurt from scratch, and I've done videos on that before, and I will show you some of that again in the future. All right, on to the next meal. Here we go. Here's This is Levi, my seven-year-old. He turned seven this week, and on his birthday, he requested a lemon pound cake. So I'm pulling some lemons out of the freezer. I freeze some lemons whole when I do my bulk citrus order in January. And this gives me the bulk in-season prices, and then I can just pull them out as needed throughout the rest of the year. So I pulled out eight of them for this lemon pound cake, and they're going to sit on the counter and thaw for a little bit until we need them. This is the book that we're going to get our lemon pound cake recipe from. This is one of David's cookbooks that he uses in his baking classes, and it has an amazing lemon pound cake recipe inside. And this is what I'm choosing to use, but I'm going to adapt it and make it dairy-free since we can't have dairy in our house. So what I love about these European cookbooks and Canadian cookbooks is that they weigh ingredients most of the time instead of measuring, and I much prefer that. So we are going to weigh out, um, we are doubling this recipe. So we did 340 grams of flour, and then since it's a pound cake, you do equal amounts then of sugar. And so especially if you are um, grinding your wheat, which we didn't do for this cake, but I've been doing a lot of um, grinding my own fresh milled flour, weighing out your ingredients is so much easier than measuring it um, by the cupful. So I like this recipe a lot. We are also adding um, just a little bit of baking powder. I added one teaspoon. And since we're making this dairy free, we are going to need to add olive oil. We use regular olive oil in place of butter. And I'm trying to remember, we did 320 grams of butter, or I'm sorry, of the olive oil and added that. Next, we're going to add our eggs and we did eight eggs. I love to use my duck eggs for baking. I just think they, um, they have like a thicker white and a larger yolk and they are perfect for baking. My kids don't prefer the taste of duck eggs scrambled up just for breakfast and things like that, but they are perfect for baking. So that is what they use them for. All right. So we're getting all of those ingredients mixed together for our pound cake. Pound cake and angel food cake are a great way to use up eggs in your baking. So now we're going to zest some lemons. Those thawed lemons that I had frozen, I find it's best to zest them when they're still maybe half frozen if you allow those frozen lemons to completely thaw, as you zest them, they kind of get a little squishy and they're more difficult to um, get against the grater. So do yourself a favor if you're using a frozen lemon and zest it while it's still a little frozen. We went ahead and zested all eight of those lemons. And then I'm also gonna add a little bit of homemade lemon extract. I make that every January just by taking some lemon peels and allowing them to kind of infuse in some vodka. And it makes a delicious citrus extract. We're just gonna pour a little bit of that into our bowl and it'll give an added lemon punch to the cake. 
and then we're going to get this all ready to go in our pan. So things like angel food cake and pound cake, they're notorious for sticking to your cake pan. So what you really need to do is grease it up very thoroughly, get it in all the nooks and crannies of that cake pan. And then I take a little bit of flour and I lightly dust the surface of that grease. And if you do that, you should have no problem getting your cake pan out of, or getting your cake out of that pan. We're gonna pour the batter in there and then this is gonna bake on 350 degrees. And since I doubled this recipe, it takes a little bit longer than what the recipe says. And I think it took about an hour to fully cook. In the meantime, I'm gonna make some lemonade out of those thawed lemons so they don't go to waste. We've got more dirty duck eggs sitting over there that need washed. Always washing eggs around here. But anyways, turning that into some lemonade. And as always, you need to check your cake, stick something in the center, the thickest part, to make sure that it's thoroughly cooked. And this is looking good. I think Levi's gonna love this cake for his birthday. So here, let me show you how easy it is to get that out. This is still hot, obviously. I'm trying not to burn my hands, and it came right out. There's no need to hang that upside down like you have to do with some cakes. It just pops right out if you do the greasing and flouring. But now what I need to do is take this cake and make it look a little more attractive. The flavor of this is going to be amazing, but it doesn't look the most beautiful. So we are going to add a glaze to the top of this. And I change it up. Every time I make this, I add a different type of glaze. I decided on this particular day to do blueberry. So I'm taking some frozen blueberries we preserved last summer. I added some powdered sugar and just a little bit of water and we are gonna get out the immersion blender and we are gonna mix that up. And um, I ended up, if you'll see here, I added a little bit of vanilla also because I needed a little more liquid and I thought vanilla would add some extra flavor. And I like using the frozen berries and I'm gonna show you in a minute why. Because when you add the glaze to the top, the frozen berries are extremely thick and I can put that on top of the cake and as those berries begin to melt a little bit, it'll drizzle down very beautifully. So that is why I'm using the frozen fruit, but you can use whatever you wanted to make your glaze. I've done a, a lemon glaze, we've done strawberry glaze, just a plain vanilla glaze is delicious. Um, or you could just add fresh fruit, you could do whipped cream, anything like that. There's always someone willing to eat the extra icing around here, none of that goes to waste. So they'll scrape that out and eat that. And this is what that cake looked like. I'm showing you as it's melting, how that is dripping down in between the cracks, just makes for a beautiful cake. So I'm very excited about this. I think Levi's gonna love it for his birthday. He had requested hamburgers and French fries and applesauce for his birthday dinner. And then after we were done eating, we all sang happy birthday to him and he was able to blow out his candles, and it was a wonderful evening celebrating my now seven-year-old boy. I cannot believe how big he's getting. He's just a delight and a joy to our family, and we are very blessed to have him around. Um, and so this was just a fun night celebrating him. And let me show you what the inside of that cake looks like. So after everybody ate um, all of their burgers and fries, they were not extremely hungry, so everybody wanted some little slices and so I'm just getting little slices out of here and we ended up eating the rest of the cake with the next day's breakfast. But this is what the inside texture of that cake looks like. It has a delicious lemon flavor. It smells amazing. and Everybody really enjoyed that. So now let's go ahead and move on to our next recipe idea to use up some eggs. So pasta, homemade pasta, is a great way to use uh, some of your extra eggs. If you have an abundance of eggs, you can do a bulk pasta making day, and then you can uh, preserve it for later by putting it in the freezer or drying it out and getting it shelf stable. And it's just a great way to use those eggs in a way that doesn't require um, a whole lot of work. So let's go ahead and start making some homemade pasta. As you could see, we went ahead and ground our flour, we're once again using our sprouted wheat berries. That makes a much denser pasta that is a little more difficult to work with. This process is much um, easier and it makes a smoother, more pliable dough. 
if you're using uh, a white flour or a pre-ground store-bought flour. But we were just having fun experimenting. We are very new to sprouting our wheat berries. So this was our first time doing it. We've made homemade pasta before using other types of flour. This was our first time making it with the sprouted flour and it turned out pretty amazing. But the process, it was definitely very difficult <laughs> to work with. So there's a learning curve with doing this. And um, so the children absolutely loved mixing that all together for me. We're working on getting it soft and pliable. You can see with a little bit of elbow grease, we were able to get it kneaded down and softer. I will link in the description my little pasta maker machine that I have. We just have a manual hand crank one. And we're working that dough through. Uh, because it's so dense, the first time we run it through it, it tends to crumble a little bit. And then we just have to be patient. Eventually, we get it to flatten out into a nice strip. And we just continue to run it through until we get it thinner and thinner. The children absolutely love this chore. Every time I make pasta, they want to come out and help. And I love having them in the kitchen helping me. So the only ingredients in this are the flour and eggs. So once again, a wonderful way to use up your eggs. And it's really fun to experiment with different types of flour to make different types of pasta. You can add some freeze-dried powders in there. Um, to make different flavored like a spinach pasta or um, uh, sun-dried tomato pasta. It's just really fun to play around with your pasta. So make sure you do that with your eggs uh, while you have an abundance this year. So we decided to turn these into a fettuccine style noodle and the kids are making mustaches out of the longer pieces. And so as I mentioned, this dough was pretty hard to work with. We had some that turned out nice and long, and we had some that were a little more brittle that fell apart. But in the end, it all tastes the same. So we're just tossing it into our pot to get it cooked up, and the kids are going to have this for lunch. If you are gluten-free, you can experiment with making your own homemade pasta out of rice flour or cassava flour. You can do all sorts of things, um, lentil flours, split pea flours. If you have a grain mill, it's really easy to grind just about anything down into a flour that you can turn into pasta. It's a really simple meal here, hearty and healthy for the children with that sprouted grain. Everybody really enjoyed it. The children told me it was their favorite pasta they ever had. Okay, guys, this is my favorite way to use up leftovers and eggs. So I greased up my baking dish and I'm adding leftover potatoes. I'm using mashed potatoes on this particular day, but I've used fried potatoes, hash browns, any leftover French fries, any kind of potato can go in the bottom of that dish. And then the same thing for your meat, any kind of leftover meat. I've used taco meat, ground beef, ground pork, sausage, bacon. I'm using leftover bratwurst um, for this particular meal. And you just chop it up and you layer it on top of those leftover potatoes. You really can't go wrong with this. Any kind of leftovers, this is a great way to just clear out the fridge and make a nice breakfast. Same thing with vegetables. I'm using some freeze-dried chard powder. But I've used all sorts of leftover mushrooms, um, tomatoes, peppers, you name it, onion, anything really tastes good um, with this breakfast casserole. Now we have eggs here. I probably used about two dozen eggs. I added a little bit of almond milk. So once again, great way to, to get some eggs used up. And we're just going to whisk that together and simply pour it over the top of the mixture that we've already made you can season those eggs, add some garlic powder, onion powder, salt, pepper. You can spice it up with a little bit of paprika or something, whatever you like. Um, and it, it all kind of depends on if your meat and your potatoes were already seasoned the night before for the meal that they were used in. We're just going to try to flatten it out and make sure that meat is covered by the eggs. I'm adding a little bit of salt and pepper on top because my brats and potatoes already had some good flavor in there. I didn't need to add anything else. We just bake it on 350. Takes about 45 minutes to an hour, just depending on how thick the middle of your dish is. And when you're done, you have this nice uh, savory breakfast that used up a bunch of leftovers that will not go to waste. My children love this. This is another one of those meals that I make once a week. And it's, I usually try to plan this after our taco day because we always seem to have leftover taco meat and toppings. 
But on this day, I made it after we'd had some brats and mashed potatoes, and it worked out wonderfully that um, we were able to use up all the leftovers and have another hot meal. Of course, a great way to use eggs is by hard boiling them. I always add a little bit of baking soda to the water when I hard boil my eggs. Farm fresh eggs that were just laid are notoriously difficult to peel. And so I find that this helps a little bit. Um, it also helps if you use older eggs. So I'll just keep some eggs in the back of the fridge and we'll use those for hard boiling. So we're gonna make an egg salad. I do not have fresh celery, but I do have freeze dried celery. So it's really simple to use. I just put it in a bowl of water and I let that celery rehydrate for a while while I'm working on the other steps of my egg salad. So I'm just gonna chop my hard boiled eggs up. We're gonna get them in a bowl. Um, sometimes I'll make deviled eggs. Um, sometimes we'll do egg salad. Sometimes we just eat hard boiled eggs plain as a side dish, but this is something through the egg laying season that we typically have for lunch at least once a week. And my kids love it. So my process for deviled egg filling is very similar to my egg salad. I start with mayonnaise and we typically do a homemade mayo. I'm adding some kind of vegetable. It's usually celery or green pepper, something like that. I like pickled pepper juice. That's the secret ingredient in my deviled egg mixture or my egg salad. It gives it a little spice and kick and that vinegary pickly flavor. Just added some salt and pepper and we're gonna mix that together. Sometimes I'll add a little mustard if I'm not adding the pickled pepper juice, um, but either way you just need something kind of that, that vinegar flavor. Now we're just gonna get this in a bowl and keep that in the fridge. And then when the kids want a quick lunch of sandwiches, I can pull that out and they can have that on a rice cake or on some homemade bread. And then some of the kids like it, some of the kids will eat like a lunch meat or a sun butter sandwich instead. All right, now let's talk about preserving eggs because when you have an abundance, it's not just about eating them fresh, but we also need to figure out ways to preserve. So one of my favorite ways, I've done videos on this before, is water glassing. So to water glass, I have a jar here of cow lime. I have a scale. I have some water and I have a container to put everything in. And this is what we're going to use to water glass. You can see water glassing in glass will leave a lime residue on whatever can glass container you use. That's fine. You can work really hard to get it off if you want, or you can just save those jars to use for future batches of water glassed eggs. Save yourself a little elbow grease. So Miss Grace here asked me, she wanted to learn how to do this. So I'm walking her through the steps while I walk you through the steps today. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to measure out our cow lime. Cow lime is calcium hydroxide. I get mine in bulk through Azure Standard and I'll link it in the description, but it's the same thing as pickling lime that you would get in the canning section of the store. You want to make sure you're using a food grade pickling lime. Do not use garden lime, um, but as long as it's food grade, it will be safe for you to use for this purpose. So we are measuring it out. For every ounce of lime we use, we will use one quart of water. And so for a gallon size jar, I do two ounces of the cow lime and two quarts of water. So you can see we measured it out there perfectly in our measuring cup. And then what we're gonna do is put our eggs in the bottom. Now we slowly will accumulate eggs as they come in. You can only use clean eggs that have not been washed. And by that, I mean eggs that don't have any mud or any kind of muck on them. So this time of year, that might only be three out of the you know, 18 eggs that you bring in in the afternoon. And so we just make our solution, put the eggs that we do have in the bottom of it, and then slowly continue to add eggs um, as we collect them. So she put the two ounces of cow lime in the bottom of that jar. Now she's gonna add two quarts of water and I told her to be careful, do not lean over the top of this and breathe in any of that powder. You don't wanna do that. So you just kinda of take a step back and it's no big deal, it's not gonna harm you. She's pouring in another quart of the water and that is usually enough liquid that as I continue to add eggs, it will fill up the jar. I may have to make a little half jar of solution toward the end to top it off. We'll just wait and see. You can see it's very cloudy when you first add the solution in there. But then through time, that lime will settle at the bottom of your jar and that is perfectly normal. 
that's what it's supposed to do. There's no need to mix it together because it's just going to keep settling in the jar like that. And this is hours later. That's what it looked like. You can see our eggs there. I have an entire video all about all of your questions about water glassing. I'll link it in the description to answer more of your questions on this. Here's a basket of eggs that one of my girls just brought in from the coop. And you can see they're pretty clean, but we can only use perfectly clean ones. Some of these have little bits of things stuck to them. So out of all of those eggs, there were only three more that I wanted to add to this jar. I do not want to introduce the bacteria from any kind of mud or chicken feces or anything like that. And so this is what I do. I just continue every time we bring in eggs, I add the clean ones to this jar. We keep it on the counter until it's completely full. Water glassing is just one of the ways we preserve eggs. As I mentioned in the beginning of this video, when our chickens and ducks take a laying break, um, it's typically for about a two month period in the winter. And so I need to preserve enough eggs to get me through that break. And that can be upwards of 80 dozen. I think last year somewhere around 80 dozen eggs is what we were able to preserve. And I do that mainly through water glassing, but only because I have the space to preserve that many. Water glassing uses up quite a bit of space. Each jar, you know, only holds maybe two and a half to three dozen eggs. So a lot of people who maybe don't have that space on their pantry shelves or in a cellar might choose to freeze eggs instead. But once again, freezing, if you're um, doing something like 80 dozen eggs, that can use up a considerable amount of freezer space. But frozen eggs are wonderful. You can use them um, once you thaw them. You can use them for scrambled eggs and for baking, and they work wonderfully. Another way to preserve eggs, though, if space is an issue, and if you have something like a freeze dryer, you can powder those eggs up. And in my pantry challenge videos, I showed several breakfasts that we had made using powdered freeze-dried eggs that we had preserved from last year's abundant um, egg season. And so that's a great alternative if space is an issue and you have a freeze dryer, you can powder those eggs and they'll take up much less space on your pantry shelves than jars of water glassed eggs. And they will also not be occupying, you know, so much space in your freezer. So there are a lot of ways to preserve those eggs to get you through the winter. Um, and hopefully some of the tips you found in this video are helpful. All right, and that is it for this week's video. Next week we'll be back with another video to hopefully inspire you to get in the kitchen and cook from scratch and get outside and grow some food um, and just get back to the land and some of these skills that uh, we've lost through time um, in previous generations. And it's really fun to be able to grow food, preserve food, teach these skills to our children, live a more sustainable life. It's good for the earth, it's good for our children, it's good for our bodies everyone benefits. All right, friends. Um, that is it. I hope you have a blessed week and we will see you next week. Bye.